Hello, I'm Gabriel Gonçalves, an international coach, teacher and trainer specialized in the field of hard intelligence. I help people create relationships, lifestyles and careers that they absolutely love. And I do this by showing you how to access your inner resources of love, joy, wisdom and power that become available to you when you start connecting with your emotional, intuitive, energetic and spiritual heart. Through individual and group coaching programs, online courses and live seminars, I teach a wholehearted approach to personal and spiritual development, emotional mastery and conscious relationship building. Basically, I'm here to help you give birth to the most amazing, loving, joyful and powerful version of you. You can find out more about me and the work that I've been called to do in this world by visiting my website www.heartintelligencecoach.com There you will be able to book a session with me and find out more about my upcoming seminars. Today in Matters of the Heart we're talking to Jeff Foster. Jeff is a spiritual teacher and author from England who with humor and compassion loves teaching and speaking about non-duality in a very simple and direct way. He also enjoys talking about emotional healing and the process of heart awakening or just awakening to the greater reality about your life. The type of reality where you begin to find the sacred in the ordinary life that you live. I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Jeff. <laughs> it is awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that um, to our audience that um, it's been really fascinating time um, over the past three and a half days to just be here sitting with Jeff, uh, an incredible group of about 20, 25, 30 people. Um, there's been tremendous amount of um, just aha moments that people have experienced. And I have to say, just from somebody that is actually relatively new to Jeff's work, that um, what has really moved me or... or, or uh, impressed me the most about Jeff is his ability to be fully available, present, real, authentic um, in every one of the meetings and whoever he's with. And regardless of whether if it's uh, the closest people to him or just a complete stranger who's addressing him, he has that ability to make you feel very important as if you were the only person in the world. Um, so Jeff, it's, it's really a delight to be able to, to have this conversation with you. Um, I haven't really shared this uh, with you in, mm -hmm. in the brief, the, the small time that we've shared together, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came up um, upon you, how, mm -hmm. how I stumbled upon you. But um, I happened to read that report where you were named among like the first one, top 100 most influential spiritual teachers. Living, of, living, yeah, spiritual. living spiritual teachers <laughs> of our time. Apparently I'm, I'm living. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, <laughs> And what, what, what came up really strongly for me was that you were actually the youngest in that, in that list. Um, and so I thought to myself, wow, I need to, I need to look this guy. Like, who is this young guy who's like supposed to be, you know, supposed to know so much? So um, the first thing that came up was like a YouTube video where somebody was interviewing you. And this interview lasted for about 20 minutes. And all you did was laugh, laugh. nonstop. <laughs> 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 that was like my introduction to you. <laughs> so, uh, sorry if you can go look at look up that interview anytime you want to. But he's just like every time he's about to start speaking, they break down into a laugh, and they I don't think they ever did the interview. The whole interview was just really him like laughing for twenty minutes, and the other guy because they got this uncontrollable laugh attack. So when I when when I saw that, I said, "This is one guy I really would love to be able to hang out with." Um, so when I heard that you were going to come, I told myself I have to be there. Because um, I wanted to hang out. So, how how you know in in your story, uh, mm -hmm. you know how did you how is it that you became a spiritual teacher and only that to be you know to to even make it on on this list? How did I become a spiritual teacher? I don't I don't think I ever did. You're still working <laughs> at it. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean at no point did I ever I never consciously uh, decided to become teacher or I mean even a spiritual teacher I mean I um I guess a few years ago I was just uh I was invited to talk um by that point I think I had I had a book out I had a book published in the UK um it's a kind of a collection of stuff I'd written over the previous few years and 
I was just invited to talk and it um I mean, at that point I because I, I never had a spiritual I had I never had a teacher myself. You know, I'd never um had a guru or even be, I'd never been to a retreat in my life. I'd never um met with any teach I mean I'd read a lot of books and I'd done a lot of um meditation and just sitting and looking at um looking at my thoughts and looking at basically exploring my own suffering and uh but I never had a teacher, so I didn't really know what a, I didn't know what a spiritual teacher was really, or what they were supposed to do, what they were supposed to say. I mean, I I never really, I mean, I still don't. I actually don't see myself as a teacher. I don't see myself certainly as a, as a spiritual. Teacher. I mean, I've all I've always from the beginning seen what I do as a, it's just a kind of it's a sharing. It's, it's sitting with friends with equals. I can't for a moment pretend that I'm superior to. Um, anyone or that I actually know more um, than anyone here I guess this isn't really about knowing more it's, in a strange way it's about knowing less um, knowing less and, and sharing the journey sharing the journey and yeah. um, sharing just sharing what what I've discovered or, or what I've seen or what I've realized um, I've certainly I mean in my in my short life I've I've known quite intense suffering and despair and um, depression and anxiety and terrible shyness and self-consciousness. And I, I seem to have found some freedom in that or freedom from that or some way out of that. I mean, however you want to say it, I don't, I don't really, um, it's funny, I don't really uh, hold on to the story of my life too much. It's, um, this is more about, the meetings that I do these days, they're more about just sitting together, exploring our experience together, you know, mm. f and finding some place of deep acceptance within, within what's happening. I mean, whatever is happening. Um, so that, that's what I appear to be doing with, with, with my life. It, it was never really <laughs> planned this way, but I guess the best things in life aren't mm. planned. You know, if, if someone had told me five years ago that I would be, but even that I would be doing meetings, I mean, let alone traveling around the world doing retreats and let alone doing interviews and people asking me about my life and how I became a spiritual teacher. <laughs> I would have, uh, if someone had told me that five years ago, I would have laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. You know? um, but this is, what, this is what's happening. That's beautiful. <laughs> so what, what um, culturally do you belong to any, um, like any tradition? Are you Jewish? You know, were you raised Christian? Um, my parents were Jewish, but not really Jewish. So we weren't really religious. And I, I mean, from a very early age, I, I rejected religion. You know, like I'm structured religion. I, I was never really interested. I and I became, I was, I was an atheist really most of my life. I rejected anything religious, spiritual. I, no one can tell me what to do. You know? mm. I mean, I, I was, I studied um, science at, at university, so I was very rational. You know, I only believed in any. If something couldn't be proved through science, I wasn't interested. Um, and then I, um, in my mid, uh, early 20s, early 20s, I, I had this, well, I was living in London. I had this breakdown, you know, I'd, I'd been um, depressed by my whole life, really. And it just got worse as I got older, it got worse and worse. And then in, you know, living in London, I, I was in this relationship with this girl and it was incredibly intense and we were going to get married and she was going to save me. And then it all fell apart. Mm. As these things sometimes do. Mm. And it sent me into a just deep despair. I, I was at rock bottom. And then, then on top of that, I got physically, I, I got quite ill as well. My body, I guess my body was reacting to that. I got, I was quite ill. So everything just fell apart. My, my whole life fell apart. And in hindsight, it's great. I'm so pleased if <laughs> it all fell apart because that's what started me asking these these questions these basic questions about life like who am i and what is life all about is life really all about you know making money being a success finding finding a partner who will complete me and 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 um is life is, is life all about the future or you know i, I started to explore teachings of buddhism and i started to meditate and um, um i just started to ask these these fundamental questions about life and about death as well i i, I was fascinated with 
death. I just I never thought about death. And suddenly, um, in the you know, because of this breakdown, I just started thinking about death and the well, geez, one day I'm gonna die and it could be tomorrow. Mm. So what the hell am I doing with my life? If I if I can die tomorrow, what the hell am I doing? And I started to, um life is life is so incredibly precious. What the hell am I doing? You know, working in a job that I hate. And um so all sorts of things started to change and I started to um well, I started to look for enlightenment. I mean, that that at that point, I got really interested in all these teachings of enlightenment. But I, I was, I mean, I was really, I know, as I said, I never actually went to a, a teacher or a guru. But I, I read a lot. Mm. I read all sorts of books. I, I just became, I was like an obsessive seeker, you know, looking for the answers. I read books on, on Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Zen, 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 Sufism, uh, Christian. I mean, everything, everything. And um, I became obsessed with enlightenment. I thought um, I thought enlightenment was the answer, you know. And one day I would become enlightened, and I tried to become enlightened, did everything to become enlightened. That didn't work. So in the end, I was just I was left exhausted. You know, I, in a way, I tried everything. Um, to basically, I realize now what I was doing. I was trying to escape what is. I, re- I mean, it's a very simple way of saying. It. I just, all these, these are all just very complicated ways of avoiding, sure, feeling what I actually felt in the moment of, of ba- basically avoiding this moment. That's really what I was doing. Um, and I was, I, 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 in a way, I was, I was so intelligent. You know, I, I was educated at Cambridge, and my mind was so clever at finding like ways of avoiding feeling what I felt, ways of avoiding this moment. You know the these sensations, these feelings, these thoughts, ways of escape. So I was, I was very clever. I was very, very clever. So, and at some point it all just fell apart. I just, uh, I just realized, uh, basically, uh, realized basically you can't escape this. And uh, that's what really changed things. It's like from that point, you know, the focus of my life became this moment and and allowing allowing what's here uh, i mean that's um i mean that was the basic realization and i know over the next few years it kind of deepened and 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 but that really became the focus of my life is recognizing who i really was mm. um which as, as i as i share these days you know who you really are is uh, just an open space, uh, a wide open space, um, in which every thought, every sensation, every feeling is is allowed. All, all of life is allowed in you. All the all the the good stuff and the bad. Stuff. You know all this. You know the the positive, happy emotions like joy and bliss and excitement. And what's also allowed in you is is what we call the the negative stuff. Fear is allowed in you. Sadness is allowed in you. Even pain is allowed in you. Like that's um, what you are. Seems to be vast enough to to allow all of it. You know. Um, and I I just realized that my whole life that's really what I'd been looking for was who I really was. You know. And I'd been looking for it in the future. I'd been looking for it in other, through other people. I'd been looking for it through through religion. Mm. And through even through spirituality, but I've been looking for it outside of this present moment, which is which is all there is. Um, so that's that's really what I share these days is um, just a, this deep acceptance of of the present moment, which is really what you are. What you are is that deep acceptance. Right. You know what you are is. Just the capacity, the wide, the wide open space in which every thought, every sensation, every feeling is is allowed. Like what you are embraces all of life, and and you could also call that love. I, think. Mm. Uh, I should probably use the word love since this. That's yeah, the name well, that's that's what I like to call it too. <laughs> yeah. Mm, so this thing, this thing called love, right? Which is, this I really do love. believe. I mean, from where I, from uh, past three and a half days, I've been listening to you. Mm. I mean, there is no doubt because this is my language. 
you know, I call it, he's just really talking about love. But, and this, obviously, this is your core message, but um, if you had to explain this to, like, a five-year-old kid, right? Well, they wouldn't have to. They'd probably already know it. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, let's suppose well, a little kid who just got off the uh, a UFO from a different planet. Okay. No, but let's suppose, you know, sometimes um, we, what happens, I, I, in my experience, when we get too philosophical about these spiritual concepts of acceptance, is, you know, it becomes just another idea. So mm -hmm. how would you explain this to just, to just a kid who just wants to know, you know like let's say is your kid, that, you know, what is it that you do? You know, where do you go around? What is it that you tell people every time you travel, Daddy? Well, <laughs> so what would you say? I first, say, I first say, why are you calling me daddy? You're not my son. <laughs> But, uh, so I, I think my basic message, if I could really say it very, very simply, is you're perfect as you are. You're perfect exactly as you are. Mm. It's the thing we don't, we forget that. We don't, you know, we, we, for, we forget that we are perfect as we are. You know, we, we forget that we are deeply okay as we are. Even when, you know, feelings like sadness are appearing in us, feelings like you know, fear is appearing, or even when there's pain, somehow even within that experience we are we're fine. Like mm. we're we're okay. That who we really are, who we really are, um is okay. In a way that we can't understand, in a way that we'll never be able to understand, even when there's pain in you or there's fear in you or there's sadness in you, somehow all of it is allowed in you. And there's, you know, on the deepest level, there's nothing wrong with you. Because I think so many people live with that, that basic feeling that there's something wrong with them. Mm. And on the deepest level, there must be something wrong with them. You know? And then it's like we spend our whole lives trying to work out what's wrong with us or trying to get rid of everything that we think is wrong with us and become some perfect being you know so what we end up doing is uh, we we reject you know we 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 reject certain thoughts and feelings in in ourselves we don't want to feel them we try and push them away because we think they shouldn't be there and that, mm. and that, but that's what we've we've been taught You know, we've been taught that we shouldn't feel sad or we shouldn't feel angry or we shouldn't feel fear or we shouldn't have these kinds of thoughts or those kinds of thoughts. Or, and the reality is they still appear in us. You know, um, I mean, the metaphor I use a lot is the, the metaphor of the ocean and the waves. So what you are is like a vast ocean. And throughout the ages, we, we've, you know, we've used words like consciousness or awareness or spirit or source or God or love, mm, actually. Right. And, but in the end, it doesn't really matter what word you use. You know, you, you might call it love. Someone else might call it consciousness. Yeah. Or someone else might call it God or spirit. Or, yeah. I, think, I, so I, I, was, I, I just, uh, when I'm talking to people, I said, I don't care what you call it, just call it forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Doesn't matter what you call it, you are it. Exactly. You know, it doesn't matter what well, you call it. Embrace it. Embrace it. it. Yeah. So if what you are is the ocean, then what appears in the ocean are all these these little waves. You know, so thoughts are waves, sensations are waves, feelings are waves, sounds are waves, smells are waves. All all of these waves are always appearing and disappearing in, in what you are, but what you are remains. This this is really what what we forget that who we really are is ever present and can't be destroyed, can't be ultimately can't be hurt. You know, the, a wave can't hurt the ocean. You know how a feeling, however intense it is, even if it's very intense sadness, for example. Say you know you've we talk about relationships. Say you've just you've ended a relationship. A relationship is over, and, and a, hu a huge wave of grief is appearing. A huge wave of Sadness is appearing. So what we normally do is we we don't fully allow ourselves to feel that because we've been taught, you know, we've been taught to believe that there's something wrong with sadness, or we shouldn't feel sad, or we shouldn't feel too sad. Right. Um, there's the whole idea of happy ever after. Yeah, yeah. We we've been we believe that we should um, 
that we should feel certain feelings and we shouldn't feel other feelings. And the truth is all feelings are allowed in what you are, not just the good, not just what we call the positive ones or the good ones. And that, and that's funny, isn't it? That we, that we split reality like that. We call some feelings positive and some feelings right. negative or some are good and some are evil even, or, or some are healthy, some are unhealthy. But the reality is that as, as this vast ocean of, of love, or of consciousness, whatever you call it, as this ocean, this ever-present ocean, all feelings are allowed in what you are. Right. So even if, and even if a wave is very, very intense, even if you know a very intense wave appears, like very intense sadness, still what you are can't be threatened by that. In in a in a way that you can't understand, what you are in this moment is a, it's actually allowing that sadness to be there. What you are is actually saying yes to that sadness. What you are doesn't need to escape the sadness because what, what you are is deeply allowing that sadness to be there. And it and it will as a wave, it will come and go. You know, it's just it's just it's like allowing it to just pass through you. Because what, what we normally do, we don't allow it. We don't allow some of these waves. Because we're on some level it's like we're afraid of them. But why why are we we are why are we afraid to feel what whatever is appearing in the moment? Why are we afraid to feel it? We're actually we're just not taught in the school. We're not taught, you know, you know by our parents who actually serve as our main. Yeah. Or you know, movies. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, as like as a as a kid, you know, you you feel sad, so you you might go up to mummy or daddy and you and you you express it, you you know, or you burst into tears in front of them, or you or you even just tell them that you're sad, and inevitably, you know, out of love, they'll try and make you happy. Right. They'll try and take the sadness away, make you feel better. Or they'll say, or, or they'll ask you, what, what's what's wrong? Right. That's, that's a question we love to ask. What's wrong? We always ask that. What's wrong? Right. It's a funny question, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. And it's also the, the where where the problem starts, if you think about it. Yeah. Um, Jeff, for anybody who might be listening to us, who might just be feeling like, okay, I don't really understand what he's talking about. I'm just in pain right now, and because you know somebody broke my heart. Or I just got fired from my job and, and, and feel like shit. You know, I have all these feelings, but I still have to get out there and function in the world. You know, how do you get over a big disappointment like this? How do you get over a broken heart? Is there such a thing as a broken heart? Well, there is. What there is is um, intense pain, intense grief, intense fear. That, that's what, you know, obviously that's what can appear, especially after you've, you've lost someone. Or someone that you love, or something, um, something that you had has left, or something that you um, thought would last forever has has finished. You know, it's it's like so so often in life we're faced with um, you know, something happens that we we didn't want it to happen. We we thought life would be different. You know, we hoped and expected that life would be different, and you know, um, and then what can appear is. In that situation, is great sadness or grief or despair, even despair or fear. And um, the thing is, in when you recognize, in recognizing who you really are, you know who you really are, is this vast ocean in which these feelings are allowed. You know, however intense the sadness is, however intense the pain is, just recognize in, in this moment that what you are is is still present. Is, is still here no matter how intense the wave is as the ocean you're still present and that the pain is in a way however much you don't want it to be there it's there you know and, and so on some level on some level it's already allowed to be there on some level it's already allowed to be here it's already been allowed into what you are and in a way we're, we're, we're afraid to really feel the pain because on some level, it's like we're afraid that something will break. You know, we're afraid that somehow our heart will break, or or and we won't be able to fix it. It will it will break and it will stay broken. Or we're, you know we're worried that like the intensity of it. Sometimes these waves can be so intense, feelings can be so intense. It's like well, this, if I really just allowed this, it would destroy me. But the, I mean, the great discovery is that what what you are actually can't be destroyed. What you are can't be broken. So, in a, in a very strange and paradoxical way, when you allow your heart to break, fully break, that's when your heart can't break. 
Right. It it's cannot like, break. It, it, can't it break. can actually open more than anything. Yeah, well, exactly. Because it can take anything. What you know, what what you are can really can take as the ocean you can take any wave however intense it is and however uncomfortable it is and however much the mind wishes that that wave wasn't there the reality is that this is what you're feeling right now right and so it's not it's not to pretend that you're not feeling that it's not about pushing that feeling away it's not about you know you, you can hope as you could hope you could you know we, we hope that the feeling will go away and still in this moment it's here and so i, I always talk about everything as a um invitation you know a wave of pain or fear or sadness appearing now. It's not a threat to what you are. It's not going to break who you really are. Um, what might be broken are your are your dreams of how this moment should be. Your your yeah. dreams of how life should have gone. That's yeah. what that's what can break in a way. It's your your hopes and dreams of how how your life should have been, how things should have worked out. But yeah. that that's the mind. That's a story. That's the story. A story. Yeah. So, you know, I, um, I have this thing when I work with clients, um, I have this saying that goes, there's not such a thing as a broken heart, only a heart that is getting ready to love more. And, and with, I, I completely agree with you. Um, listening to you this past few days, I realized, you know, the deeper meaning behind this phrase. And it's just that, it says that what's, it's, it's not your heart that it's breaking. It's your mm-hmm. mind, your idea, your image Dreams. that you had yeah. about what love was supposed to be. And then all of, all of a sudden, by live giving you the opportunity or an invitation to shatter that idea, mm. then your heart actually expands, or your capacity to love, or to mm. or to see love beyond that story. You know, even if you end up moving to other bigger study, yeah. the bigger and better you know stories, but at least you are you are expanding your capacity to love. In this in this moment, you know, um, even if great pain is appearing. And this this really goes against everything that we're taught about love. But pain pain is not pain doesn't mean you've lost love. You can't lose love. True love you can't you can't lose. What well, what you are is the love that you think you've lost. Hmm. What well, what you are is real love. Is true love. Love love that can't come and go. And in this moment, that pain is allowed. You know it's. Um, I mean, another way of saying that is love somehow allows pain. Pain doesn't block love. Pain doesn't mean that love is missing. Pain, in a way, is just an invitation to realize that love is vaster than you ever thought mm. it was. That love is, love is bigger. Love is more um, all-encompassing and more deeply accepting than you ever thought possible. Our, our ideas of love are so limited. Pain, even intense pain, is just a massive invitation to let go of all your, as you said, all your ideas of what love is. Because mm. so often we, you know, we we think that, and we're taught this is, our, this is our conditioning. Love, we think that love means feeling good all the time, or love means love is just feeling nice, happy, positive feelings. So then, when pain appears, we feel so lost. You know, we feel lost and alone and helpless and. We feel that we we had love, and now we've lost love because pain is here. The pain, if pain is here, it must mean love has gone. But the pain is actually an invitation to realize that true love hasn't gone. Your idea of love maybe has gone, you know. But true love, which is the love that you are, is still here somehow. And again, in a way that you can't understand, yeah, you can't it, it, understand. It is exp- the way that I see it is that it's it's, it's expressing through the pain, through the pain, it's expressing through the feelings of joy, it's expressing mm-hmm. through the um, you know the, maybe the act of forgiveness or that deep compassion, yeah, or maybe sometimes the disgust. You know, um, you know, I, I um, you talk a whole a great deal about the uh, the anal- you know the the metaphor of the of the wave and and the ocean, and I also. And you've spoken about how it's important not to label the emotions because the mind wants to label the emotions good or bad. Good or bad. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I like this idea because we're talking about water. So every time emotions come up, I'll just call it juice. <laughs> yeah, I call it juice. So I'm working, when I'm working with a client, I said, just let go of the label, good or bad, anger or this. Just call it juice. Let me know what does that juice feel like. You know, where juice. is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I like and, that. and then because then I realize when we really when we connect with that juice, which ultimately it's an expression of love from where I see it. Um, then you can use that juice to hopefully maybe channel it or or direct it 
into what you really want. So at that moment, then, you know, by fully embracing it, then it just, it's like it's transformed. But mm -hmm. not because my, my goal is transforming. My, my goal is, is to befriend it, is to... That's your own, that is your only goal, is to yeah. deeply allow. Yeah. That's, that's, in a way, that's your only job. Mm. That's your only job in life, I think, is to deeply, deeply allow whatever life throws at you, whatever thoughts, whatever sensations, whatever feelings. It's all, it's all juice. It's all juice. You know, it's all, it's all, they're all the waves and all the waves are water. They're not separate from the ocean, which is what you are. They, they feel in a way, once you, once you label the waves, you call this anger, you call this fear, you call this pain. In a way now, now it feels like it's something separate from you. It's something that shouldn't be there. But when you realize actually it's, it's just water, it's just, it's just a wave in the ocean. And as, as a wave in the ocean, not only is it allowed in what you are, but it's not separate from what you are. Not only is it allowed in what you are, but it's not separate from what you are. And anything that appears can be, can be used for that, for that realization. Life doesn't give you, in a way, life doesn't throw anything at you that can't be used for that realization. Even the intense pain of a, of a breakup. Either you see it, the pain as the worst thing that's ever happened to you and you just can't wait for it to go away, or you see it as a real invitation. Can this also be allowed? Maybe your whole life you you ne were never able to allow it, but it's, um, or your whole life you thought this this could never be allowed. But life keeps on throwing these things. You know, show, it, life is just showing you look everything actually can be allowed. Look, what you are is vast enough to allow allow it all. And in that allowing, yeah, you open up to the kind of love that you never thought was possible. But that ev so even pain can be used. You know, even the most intense pain that we we spend our whole lives running away from. That's because that's what we're taught. We're taught pain is bad, love is good, or fear is bad and joy is good. You know, but actually, it, none of it is good or bad. It's all it's all juice. It's all juice. <laughs> <laughs> Raw juice, unpasteurized. Raw juice. <laughs> actually, the, you know, it's funny because uh, um, and I did a, a course on uh, raw food preparation. You know, most raw food already contains within itself the enzymes that you need in order to digest it. So it's when it's raw emotion, it's almost like it contains within itself your ability to beautiful. deeply allow yeah. it and, and digest it. It's really interesting. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah, rather than trying to boil them and pasteurize them, which is kind of what we do. <laughs> <laughs> so in your teaching, is there, um, is there space for the heart? Do you ever talk about the heart? You know, well, no. <sighs> we look at the heart as the organ of love, you know, the center. It's, it's the very first organ that actually forms in a fetus. Mm. I don't know if you know that. You know, but it actually the very first organ that's developed no. is the heart. You know what the second one is? No. The tongue. Really? Yeah. Quite interesting, huh? Yeah, so, you know, and it's also, you know, there's a tremendous amount of um, research done by the, what's it called, the uh, Heart Math Institute. It talks about the electromagnetic field of the heart being something like 10,000 times more powerful than the electromagnetic uh, field that, that is generated by the brain. Um, so. Do you, you know, given these things, you know, where, what are some of your thoughts, ideas? Do you talk about the heart when you work with people? What role does the heart, of, you know, play in spirituality and, and, and this thing of fully accepting? Is it the heart that accepts it? Do we accept our heart? I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just here, just really curious, <laughs> like, making this question long ass to give you time to give me time to think about to it. Think about it. <laughs> keep, keep on going. <laughs> I don't even... Keep on talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's um, in a way, it's all heart. You know, if if heart just means love, I mean, I think heart, heart is heart is just a symbol for love, isn't it? We, it mm. I don't. I mean, the, the actual organ the heart where it, it pumps blood around the body you know that's not that's um pumps the juice pumps the juice around the body <laughs> um in a way what you know we we've always it's funny we've always it's part of our conditioning is that you know we've been taught that we've been taught that heart and mind are somehow separate mm -hmm. there's, there's the mind and there's the heart you know the mind thinks and the heart loves but actually i don't think they were ever separate in the first place right in the you know what you are in in a way is the absolute union of heart and mind. It doesn't it what you are doesn't split between heart and mind. You know, um, there's there's a lovely quote I sometimes um I sometimes quote. Um, it's by the spiritual teacher uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj, 
It's a very beautiful quote. He says, Wisdom tells me that I am nothing, but love tells me that I'm everything. And between the two, my, my life flows. It's like heart and mind. Um, but I, I'd go, I mean, I go even further than that and say that heart and mind, it's not even between the two, my life flows. It's, they are one. In, in this deep acceptance, in this deep acceptance that I talk about, there's no split between heart and mind. I mean, what, um, it's, it's wisdom and it's love. It's wisdom, it's clarity and it, and it's love. So, I mean, I, I was talking about this in, in the meetings um, on, on this retreat that, you know, when pain is deeply allowed in us, I mean, any kind of pain, any kind of pain, um, when we just notice that in this moment, what we are is already holding the pain. It's a, what we are is already allowing in the pain. Mm. In a way, anything that appears in you has already been allowed. I mean, this is this is a really huge realization. They really don't teach this to you in school. But if if anything is appearing in you, any thought, any sensation, any feeling, even if it's very intense pain, what you are has already allowed it in. That's why it can be here, because somehow life has already allowed it in. Mm -hmm. You're only in a way you're only ever facing in your own experience. You're only ever facing what's already been allowed in. So what you are in a sense is is both nothing and everything and the, and this sound, to the mind this sounds like a complete paradox what you are is nothing in the sense it's no thing it can't be defined what you are ultimately can't be defined and we have all sorts of thoughts and stories about ourselves i'm this i'm that i'm good i'm bad i'm lucky i'm unlucky i'm enlightened i'm not enlightened i'm lovable i'm unlovable i'm love, love. yeah mm. but ultimately what we are can't be can't be defined it can't be defined so in that sense it's nothing and recognizing that is wisdom it's clarity wisdom but at the same time what you are as that open space that can't be defined as that ocean is also allowing it's allowing in right now in this moment i'm not talking in like an abstract sense i'm it's like look in this moment in this moment, just notice the thoughts, the feelings, the sensations that, that are appearing you know, in you. So these thoughts are appearing, these sensations are appearing, these feelings. You know, right now there might be a feeling of sadness or fear or confusion or, or pain. But just notice that, again, in, in a way that you can't understand. Don't try to understand it intellectually, but just, just notice these Feelings, these thoughts are, are already here. So, on some level, they are already allowed in you. Mm. You know, we, we talk about allowing, we talk about trying to allow, trying to accept. You know, we, we talk about, oh, well, one day I'll find acceptance. One day, I'll, or one day I'll find someone who will accept me. Because mm -hmm. in, in relationships, that's often yeah, what we're or, looking for. Or I'll find the right and perfect partner. Or I'll find the right and perfect partner and they will unconditionally love me and unconditionally accept me 24 hours a day, 365 days a year until I die. That's, mm -hmm. That would be the ideal. Yep. <laughs> yep. That would be the ideal thing. Yep. And it's, it's a beautiful dream. Mm. But so often we're, you know, we're, we get so disappointed when they, they don't live up to that. I mean, who can live up to that, really? That image. You know, we, we long for someone to unconditionally love us and unconditionally accept us no matter what we feel, no matter what we think, no matter what we say, no matter what we do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, good luck. Yeah, but they can only, you, we are the only person that That's can exactly do it. That. Yeah. We're, what we're really looking for, I think, in a relationship on the deepest level, what we're really looking for is what we already are. What you are is that unconditional acceptance It's that's already allowing in this moment. What you are has already allowed your present experience. It's, it's allowing you in this moment to feel exactly what you feel and it's not judging you for it. What you are is allowing you to feel this pain right now and it's not punishing you for it. It's not, it's not saying that you're wrong. It's not saying that you shouldn't feel it. It's, it's what we seek in, an, in a partner actually is what we already are. You know? and, and so recognizing that in yourself spares your partner you know, and, it, and it makes life a hell of a lot. <laughs> 
yeah. simpler and yeah. easier and, and more fun. Yeah, and, and it, it really lets them off the hook. It the lets end. them off the hook, big time. <laughs> yeah, it takes away a tremendous amount of responsibility yeah. for them to make you happy. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, that's a beautiful realization that no one can make you happy. Mm. No one can provide you with the love that you seek. No one can provide you with, no one can take away your pain for you. You know, um, and of course, then when people don't live up to those expectations, this this person doesn't live up to my expectation. Well, then maybe the next one will. Right. So we we seek, we go from one part to the next part to the next part, right. no, waiting for the one. I mean, we right. we talk about looking for the one. What are we really looking for? Is the one that we are, right? The one, as in the one, meaning the 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 wide open space, the the ocean, right? In which every thought, every sensation, every feeling right now is deeply allowed. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. you you are the one. Yeah, you are the one yeah. that you seek. That, that gives a whole different um, meaning to, you know, when I talk to people and I tell them that you must become the person that you want to date. You know? And it's not that you have to develop those qualities, but you must begin by first deeply loving and accepting yourself before expecting anybody else to, of course, to want to be in that space. Because it's, on, it's only once you can accept, deeply accept the, all the waves in yourself, the, the pain, even the pain, the fear, the sadness, mm-hmm. everything, that you'll be able to accept it in someone else. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just waiting the rest of your life for acceptance yeah. you know and you're you're you just start to use people right. for that and and it, you put it somewhere out in the future in and the future God yeah knows when that will ever be yeah um jeff uh i wanted to tell you that um from where i see you from my perspective i see you are the kind of a spiritual teacher that really wear wears your heart on your sleeves you know and and just from being part of the meetings um you know, the fact that you laugh so much and everybody <laughs>, laughs so much. You know, there's a tremendous amount of research done on, you know, what happens when people laugh. Mm. And what happens actually, your heart opens. And the electromagnetic, you know, energy or the frequency, you know, what radiates out of an open heart actually opens the hearts of the people around it. You know, that's what heart math has discovered. Our, our hearts radiate these electromagnetic fields that can be about 15 feet, you know, um, like in each direction. So, you know, one of, th- one of the reasons why I feel that you are being so successful with your message, you know, and so many people are seeking you is because you are the heart-inspired or a heart-based spiritual teacher or a spiritual guide. You know, would you agree with that? Do you, do you, do you, do you recognize what I'm just saying? Is there some resonance? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess... I guess I just don't take life so seriously anymore. I, I realize, you know, I, I used to take life so seriously. I used to take myself so seriously, as in my the, my Im- the image of myself. You know, that that's when life becomes very serious. Mm. You're trying to protect an, an image of yourself. You forget who you really are, which doesn't need protection. Mm. And you start to protect and defend some identity, some false identity, some story of who you are. So then life becomes very serious. Because it's a twenty-four hour job trying to protect your it's image a, of yourself. It's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot, it's a of, lot work. of energy. Yeah, it's a hell of a lot of energy. So, in my experience, life kind of loses its this basic sense of heaviness, and um, in, you know, in recognizing who you really are, which doesn't it doesn't need protection. Like I'm not, I don't feel anymore really that I'm trying to defend any kind of image of myself. Um, e- even as a teacher, mm. you know, even as a teacher, I don't, I don't really see myself as a teacher. It's, it's more of a friend. So I, it's, um, yeah, you, you're part of that new paradigm that I don't know if you heard of this expression. It says that the new paradigm is uh, the old paradigm was the sage on the stage. Oh, um, now is the guide on the side. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone from That's the lovely. stage on the stage to the guide <laughs> on the side. So yeah, you become like. The body, you know, the, the somebody, somebody that's not saying do you, as I'm doing, but you're saying I'm going first, and I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to live this way. And if you yeah. guys feel like, I'm gonna share with you guys the journey. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the old way is, um, you know, the teacher telling the student how to live. Here's how to live. That, that's mm. that's the old way. The teacher, the guru, telling the student, look, this is the best way to live. This is how you should live. Um follow me, become like me, I want you to copy me, I want you to live like me. So that doesn't interest me at all. That never worked for me. Right. But there's more separation more than anything. More sep- yeah, 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 more separation. Because exactly. you feel like, oh my God, when am I ever going to be am like I gonna this? Be a- yeah. When am I going to have these experiences? When, when, when? And yeah. it again places your 
happiness, your joy, your love, your enlightenment somewhere out in the future. It places it, it places it way outside this present moment. Mm. You know, so that doesn't that doesn't interest me. Um, separating, pretending that I'm fundamentally different from anyone, it doesn't really interest me. I mean, because I'm not particularly interested in holding up any image of myself. Like this is what we're sharing here is is everyone's everyone's birthright, mm. freedom, love, whatever you want to call it. It's it's everyone's birthright. What we're talking about is who you really are. So we, who I really am, beyond the beyond the story of myself as this or that, as a as a teacher or or a student as enlightened or unenlightened, as successful or failure, or you know all the stories we tell about ourselves. Beyond all of those stories, who I am is who you are. So that, there's that absolute equality. There's that absolute equality. You know. So then. The meetings that I do, they're really, as I said, they're really just, you know, we, we sit as friends, as equals. Um, and just just because I'm sitting at the front, you know, and just because people um, have come to see me talk or have come to hear me talk or have come to my retreat doesn't mean that I'm essentially any different from them. That, that's just right. the role. That's just a temporary role that I'm playing within, right. within, within this dream. You yeah. know, I'm, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that I'm any more. Su I'm superior, or I'm fundamentally different, or I, or I'm more special than anyone. That's that, you know. Perhaps I have something to share. Perhaps I have some certain insights, ways of seeing things, way, ways in which my own suffering has seems to have uh, evaporated in many ways. Mm -hmm. you know, that's and I love sharing that with others. I'm happy to share that, but it doesn't mean. That fundamentally, I'm different or more special or more enlightened or anything. That that's the old way. You know, that's that's the old. You're right. That's that's the old paradigm. I'm special and you're not, or I'm enlightened and you're not, or right. I'm I've gone beyond my humanness and, and you haven't. And or you know, follow me, worship me, give me enough money, and maybe one day you'll be like me. That's right. that's the old way, and that it doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked doesn't because it just keeps the separation going and yeah. what this is really about is the end of separation in all its forms yeah you know so if if you're teaching in a way that if you're teaching in a way that is based in separation surely the separate it's just going to continue the separation so that doesn't really interest me what interests me is who you really are yeah so what um why exactly you know why do you do that? <laughs> Yeah, and I know trying to why we can get into a story of the mind, but you know, what is it that really makes you get on those airplanes, you know, so many times a year, go to retreats, be far away from home, be Google far away. Google Calendar. Google Calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I follow Google Calendar. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, like, what is it? Do you want to change the world? You want to make this a more loving, accepting world? You know, is there something, an ideal behind you and i know you i know you're so in the moment that you're probably going to say something like no i'm just <laughs> i'm just being who i really am but if, but please give me something give me give us a story you know why Wh why what is what is it about you is it that you become more accepting the more you show others is it that become you become more alive more heal more whole i mean more than you already are but what is it thank you for giving me so much time to think about the answer <laughs> you're, you're a really brilliant um Interviewer, I have to say. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just gave you three more seconds. <laughs> oh, you give me a few more, though. That's great. I still don't have an answer. <laughs> but we, if you want to, we can just pause the recording, and then when you're ready, we can just click on record. <laughs> um, really why do why yeah. do I do this? I mean, there's. I love it. I mean, I think that's probably the best answer. Um, I don't think I don't feel like I'm on any kind of mission to save the world or to save people. I um, or to convert people or to make people see things the way I do. I don't. I, I've never felt that. Um, there, there is, there is a, a simple joy and intimacy and love. I think in in sharing this, it's, there's something very. I think there's something very intimate about it. Mm. You know, because we're, we're not gathering to compare and contrast our stories and our achievements and, and our we're, we're kind of going beyond all of that and we're we're really meeting each other you know as we really are we're, and we're exposing what's actually here we're not pretending you know all, all the pretending 
falls away. You know, all the all the, the facade, the games that we play, and, uh, um, and what's left is just us as we actually are now. And and people are so beautiful, really, just as they are. They don't need to pretend. Or we don't need to pretend. Why do we need to pretend to be strong when we feel weak? Just feel weak. Show your weakness. Expose your weakness because we all feel it. You know, why? I mean, we pretend so much. We pretend to know. We pretend to be certain. We pretend to know. We pretend to be right when really underneath we don't know. So just admit you don't know. Admit to me you don't know because I don't know either. Right? And that uh, there's something very beautiful about that that I can't really put into I guess it's love. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. guess it's love. I yeah. guess it's love. Yeah, even if it's just love for yourself, to just be able to say, "I'm not going to put myself into that kind of a pressure to have to know it all." So I'm just going to say, "I don't know." Yeah, just accept it. Uh, I I guess in a way as well. I mean, I um also I I do feel that I'm just meeting myself. I mean, time and time again, you know, every meeting I do, everyone I speak to, everyone I have dialogue, I feel like I'm re- meeting myself. Everyone yeah. feels so familiar. <laughs> no, I, I can completely relate to where, what you're saying because I feel that my my workshops that I facilitate, groups that I coach, I feel like everybody is a camouflage version of me. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, I I really feel that. And it makes self in me, disguise. Yeah. yeah, it allows me to be more loving, more compassionate mm-hmm. with them. And and that's yeah. And if you ever feel what fascinates me is if I ever feel something uncomfortable with with someone, just to sit with that. You know, because maybe that can really teach me something that I'm still holding on to, some image yeah. of myself I'm still holding on to. Like, what, yeah. what can you threaten? Mm. Even when, when I mean, in the past four or five years doing these meetings, yeah, I've people have said some pretty challenging things to me. They've really put me on the spot. You know, and sometimes people get, you know, I mean, th- this kind of stuff that I do, the work that I do, brings up so many emotions for people. For sometimes even frustration and rage, yeah. even, yeah. and then people. People get angry at me sometimes because I'm in a way I think I'm challenging some of their most basic assumptions about life and their most precious and you do beliefs, yeah. yeah. And so it's been really a challenge for me to to, to sit with that. Yeah, but and, you know, it, it, any great spiritual teachers, you know, who have been in, in line with this, you know, some of them have had to pay with their own lives just because they came to actually speak their truth and remind mm-hmm. everybody who they really were. So mm-hmm. I can I completely relate to what you're saying. In a way, it's it's very you know sitting in front of a group of twenty thirty people. It's you know and and not protecting an image of myself. You know you you it's a very vulnerable place to be in a way. Mm. Um, and I think I, I do try and open myself up to everyone, and to not push anyone away, and to really listen to what everyone's saying, even if you know even if um, people are very frustrated or angry or they're they're being very critical about something I've just said or they, they deeply disagree with my teaching that, you know, or they completely reject my teaching totally. That's happened before. And then just to meet them in that, you know, to really listen to them and not to move to defend my teaching because that's, I think that's when you become a, a guru, you know, or, or yeah. a, um, yeah. when you start to defend your own teaching. Right. This, what, what I find is this, this teaching doesn't need to be defended. Exactly. Because if you, yeah, if you have to defend it, it means that somewhere deep inside of you, you feel that that there's some there's some truth that's not true, absolutely, you know, and you're not, or that you yourself are not sh- even sure about it. Mm. Yeah, so it would make sense, you know. I'd love to be able to talk to you some more, but oh, the it's over. Right now. I was going by so quickly. So, um, what's next for you? Um, like, where are you off to after this? Um, and then, um, and then, how can people find out more about you? Um. You know what? What is the name of your book? Uh, where can people get it? And if, obviously, you know your contact information, your website. Well, everything, everything about me and um, my teaching uh, is on my website, which is www.lifewithoutacenter.com. And um, I have a new book coming out in November this year, published mm-hmm. by Sounds True, and it's called uh, the, "The Deepest Acceptance." The Deepest Acceptance, Radical Awakening in Ordinary Life. And that's my first book in a few years. Um, I really... (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> that was the uh, that was the, um, the description of what the book is about. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't remember what my, my, my own book was about. I guess the title gives it away. The deepest, the deepest acceptance. Yes, laughing with Jeff. And I, um, I should also point out I'm. Uh... Oh, jeez. Should I put. Everything's on the website. <laughs> okay. Yes, Center is T R E. Center is T R E. Yeah. Uh, that's one. Big lesson I was reminded every, almost every day while I was here um, when I moved to South Africa because I worked for a place called the Novalis Ubuntu Center and I kept spelling it the American way. The American way. Oh. Yeah. So all my yeah my my upcoming meetings and retreats are all on my website. Everything is on your website. Yeah. So even if I can't remember anything, you just um, go to my website and it's all there. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> all right. One final one final thought uh, or word of advice to uh, our listeners. You're perfect as you are. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Jeff. And I hope that you have enjoyed today's conversation with Jeff and that you're walking away with new insights and new ideas that are going to support you in creating deeper, more loving relationships in all areas of your life. Please remember that when it comes to your heart, there's not such a thing as mind over matters of the heart. For your heart is the inner center of love, wisdom, and power that will always, always win. Until the next time we meet, I send you all of my love. Bye for now.